Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Hugh Morris. I'm a senior research partner at Xi'an. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, today's webinar, The Economic Consequences of IT, the IT Revolution's Meager Benefits and Major Schisms, uh, being described and presented by Tayum Bayumi, visiting scholar at King's College. Now, the webinars will take uh, the normal format, um, but the most important thing I have to do is thank our sponsors, uh, because without our sponsors, we wouldn't have the opportunity to range far and wide over the subjects that we do cover. Uh, so we're hugely appreciative of their support for our endeavors to inform and entertain on a range of subjects around finance and related topics. So this webinar today uh, will consist of me getting out of the way as fast as possible, uh, Tamim doing the keynote presentation for sort of 20, 25 minutes, uh, and I will then uh, filter and facilitate the uh, questions from the audience, and we always have a lively audience and great questions. Uh, and then at the end of the Q&A session, we will wrap up on time. So without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Tamim, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Hugh. Um, I, I, um, I'm uh, very privileged to uh, be able to um, have a talk to this audience. I hope that you'll find the uh, subject interesting. So what exactly am I going to talk about? Well, essentially, I'm going to talk about a uh, surprise, which is for those like me who were around in 1980, the world today is in many ways um, a tremendous, uh, a tremendous change. And we've had a huge technological revolution since 1980. Just to mention a few things, you can now talk to virtually anybody in the world when you want to, on the go, using a little mobile device. That mobile device can even tell you um, what the weather is now, what it's likely to be in the next hour. You can follow the football scores. You can do whatever you like live. So in this world, what you would have expected is that the, um, you would have expected that people would be very, very happy. But in reality, this period since 1980 has also been uh, been accompanied by growing social tensions. And the question is, why did that happen? And one of the major reasons for that is a rise in inequality after 1980 and a slowing of growth. So after World War II, there was a long period through about 1980 of high growth and income convergence, both in terms of income convergence across regions within, within advanced countries, and also income convergence between the skilled and the unskilled workers. Um, since about 1980, this pattern has reversed. We've seen growing prosperity and rising house prices in successful superstar cities such as London. But this has been accompanied by wage stagnation in less fortunate metro areas. So we've had a growing divergence in the prosperity across different regions. It's also been accompanied by mediocre growth in output and productivity and a fall in long distance internal migration. So people have simply not been able to move around the country, which is one of the things you would have thought would be a sign of prosperity in a country. This combination of low growth, rising inequality, and a lack of internal mobility, a lack of churning in the economy has unleashed strong social tensions, especially for those stranded in decaying cities. And I'm going to argue in this talk that the reason for this rise in social tensions is the nature and location of the IT revolution. So before 1980, productivity growth was mainly focused in manufacturing. What did manufacturing need? It needed 
unskilled workers and cattle, and therefore it went to poorer areas of the country where there were lots of both of those things, um, and uh, and of course sort of land for manufacturing plants and things like that, and therefore this movement of the productive part of the economy into these poorer areas generated income convergence. But after 1980, productivity growth was increasingly centered in um, the um, IT sector. And the main input of the IT sector was skilled labor. As a result, productivity growth swiveled away from the poor areas towards prosperous and crowded superstar cities where um, skilled labor was plentiful. As a result, house price and wages in these pros already prosperous cities rose. And um, in addition, because of the high house prices, as I will explain, the labor misallocation rose and national productivity growth therefore stagnated. So that's the basic story, which is that the location, the nature of IT revolution as being focused on skilled workers and its location in, in um, prosperous and crowded cities created this growing, uh, these growing schisms. So just to use a very specific example to get a sense of this, uh, let's talk about major US investments. Uh, I'm gonna talk about Toyota in the 1980s and then Amazon in the late 2010s. In 1986, when car firms were still at the forefront of manufacturing, Toyota announced its first wholly owned US factory, and that was located in Georgetown, Kentucky, population around 36,000. In 2019, Amazon, by then, again, in the uh, productive sector, the IT sector, chose superstar cities, New York and Washington DC for its second headquarters. In fact, New York rejected it and it ended up in the Washington DC area. But this switch in location of cutting edge firms is the thing which I'm talking about in terms of productivity. So how does, what are the, what's the impact of a rise in productivity on the uh, economy. I, I'm going to talk about five effects. The first is the most obvious, which is you know productivity goes up, therefore there's a gain in output and in wages. The economy expands. The second I will call the technological effect is that an industry, if an industry uses a lot of skilled labor, then the relative price of skilled labor goes up wages go up for skilled workers versus unskilled workers. Vice versa, if the industry uses a lot of unskilled labor, then unskilled wages go up. So that's the technological effect. The distortion effect is slightly more subtle. And that comes from changes in uh, house prices. And the way to think about house prices is that they raise the cost of living in an area and therefore employers have to pay this extra, you can think about it as basically a tax. So high house prices can be thought of as a tax on employers. Now, if house prices become increasingly divergent, employers will uh, have to pay more for workers in uh, high cost areas and therefore they'll employ less people there. And uh, that means that there's greater labor misallocation and this lowers growth. So higher diversity of house prices equals lower growth. The local effect is the fourth uh, thing I will talk about, which is that you, in order, for example, if you're in the IT revolution, in order to induce people to go to cities, you're going to have to raise wages even more than normal so as to get people to move in. And the final effect is the industrial structure effect uh, in which, let's say, again, in the IT revolution, you have, um, you have IT uh, coming into uh, 
cities, therefore manufacturing leads. So let's think about a very simple world in which there are two regions, a city with higher house prices that are sensitive to the level of employment and a set of towns with low house prices which aren't very sensitive to uh, employment. The towns specialize in making manufactures using mostly unskilled labor as well as capital and the city makes IT goods using skilled labor. For, we'll also assume that unskilled labor is less mobile and spends a higher proportion of income on housing. Rents from uh, housing go to rich rentiers who live mainly in the city. And the result is the city is both more prosperous because it's got higher wages and house prices, but it's also got higher inequality because of the um, presence of more skilled workers and rentiers. So what happens if in this world if we have a rise in manufacturing productivity? Well, it creates rapid growth and income convergence. Why? Unskilled wages rise nationally because recall that manufacturing mainly uses unskilled labor rather than skilled labor. Growth is high as migration out of the cities lowers their housing costs and therefore house prices become less divergent across, uh, across locations and therefore the, uh, uh, labor is better allocated. Wages rise in towns especially for unskilled workers, as I said before, and also because you have to induce these unskilled workers to move to these towns, so there's a local effect as well, and income of rentiers is squeezed. Now let's go to the other side. Let's say there's a rise in IT productivity. Well, basically this has the opposite effect, but with some subtleties to do with uh, the location in cities. So skilled wages rise, especially in the city, that's because um, IT uses mainly skilled workers and they're in the city. High house prices increase labor market distortions, and lower growth and productivity. And this is very important to understand. High house prices, because they cause um, employers to have to spend more money to employ people, the employers use less people and therefore there's a distortion in the labor market. The demand for the unskilled in the city is crimped both by how high housing costs and the loss of manufacturing. As a result, unskilled leave the cities and local wages, uh, local unskilled wages fall. Migration falls as high house prices crimp the ability of those outside of the city to move there. And so the IT revolution incre increases inequality between, between the skilled and the unskilled between the city and the town and between the young and the old, since the old have uh, wealth and the young don't. As a result, people feel stranded and unable to move to prosperity. In a sense, high house prices crimp the ability of people to move to where they want to go, where, where the jobs are and where the wealth is. Just to illustrate, uh, some of these points before moving on to uh, 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 questions and answers. Here we see some data. All of the data I'm going to talk about is for the US, in part because I wrote this paper when I was still working at the IMF, which is in the US, and in part because the data from the US is generally very good. So here is a graph showing wages, and it shows it by type of skill. So for example, the bottom purple line is people with less than a high school education. Um, the red line above it is people with high school but no more. Then uh, the green is some college. The uh, yellow is completed college and the blue is greater than college and the thicker black line in the middle is the average for all people. And on the left is uh, the least dense areas in the country and on the right Q4 is the most dense areas of the country in terms of population. So what you can see in 1980 is basically these lines are pretty parallel to each other. So 
you had some return to being more skilled. The um, the blue line for Grayson College is a lot higher than the purple line for less than high school. But as you can see, the, the lines are pretty, the, the, the uh, return to being in a more crowded place, I am um, uh, a more uh, in a city, but pretty much the same for everybody. And they go up, but they don't go up hugely. Now let's switch to the right hand panel, which shows the impact in 2010. The first thing you can see is much wider divergence. So this is the what I talked about, which is the IT revolution increased the return to skill. So the difference between the purple and the blue lines are much larger in 2015 than they were in 1980. So the return, the wage return to skill went up. The other thing to see is that in addition, um, the return to being in a more crowded place went up. And this is best seen from the thicker black line, which is all workers. Uh, it's less obvious in the other lines because there are now fewer, less than high school, more greater than college, etc. So there are some, some effects there. But as you can see from the two black lines, the black line on the right is much steeper than on the left, and therefore uh, the return to being in a city has gone up a lot. But now if we look at the uh, bottom two lines on the right in 2015, we see this is not true for those with less than high school or a high school education. And this is what I talked about, that actually because of this demand for skilled workers in cities, unskilled workers have actually been pushed out. And the way that that occurs is by lowering their wages in the city compared to towns so that people are induced to move out. So here in one graph, you see a lot of the uh, factors that I've been talking about in terms of the impact of the IT revolution on the wage structure, and therefore on inequality. Here is a more general uh, uh, picture. And what this shows is the difference in house prices across different locations in the US, different cities in the US. It also shows income, the divergence in incomes across um, that. The house price is the yellow line. The income divergence is the black line. And both these are just simple standard deviations. And then finally, we have a coefficient on the degree of migration per 100,000 people. So what you can see is a big rise in house price divergence across locations. Um, it almost doubles. Uh, you can see a pretty steady rise. You can also see the housing bubble in 2008. Uh, the rise in income divergence is less strong but you can see there's a very clear rise in income divergence over time as well. So we've got a rise in inequality across locations and in particular in uh, differences in house prices across locations. And remember that uh, these differences in house prices are one measure of labor misallocation and therefore why growth has been slowing. And finally, you can see on the blue line of migration that as house price divergences have risen, migration has fallen. So here in a nutshell is the story that I've been telling in words in a picture. Now let's drill down into uh, house prices and wages in individual cities. And the cities I'm talking about, the US has this wonderful census-based statistical areas. Um, but what they are is they're basically a catchment area for um, the labor force within an area. So for example, around Washington DC, it's approximately a 60 mile radius. Um, and what you can see on the, um, on the left is house prices across these locations. And the, um, the pink line is what house prices were across locations in 1980 and the blue is 
the frequency of house prices in 2016. What you can see in 1980s is pretty close to a normal, uh, a normal curve distribution. So, you know, some places had somewhat higher house prices, some places had somewhat lower house prices, but it was all around a pretty well-defined norm. By 2016, you can see the rise of superstar cities. You now have a, house, a, a bimodal distribution. You have a relatively big peak um, at about 0.8 of the overall house prices. And this is sort of, if you like, sort of normal cities. And then you can see a second peak at about 1.5 times relative house prices, which are the superstar cities, which boomed over the IT revolution. So what you can see is a very big change in the nature of house prices. And this change can also be seen in relative wages. On the right, the, uh, you can see the distribution of relative wages. And again, in 1980, there was a relatively simple normal curve. Some places paid more, some places paid less, but it was all pretty much within one distribution. What you can see by uh, 2016 is this has bifurcated again into low wage cities and then a small minority of high wage cities with new peaks um, on the right. Now, if you make some very simple assumptions, for example, that people spend 30% of their income on housing and that housing uh, rentals are proportional to uh, house prices, you can then calculate post-tax uh, wages. And here you can see post-tax wages. And what's interesting here is you don't get the bimodal uh, effect. So to some extent, what's happening is by 2016, you do have these very high house price and high wage cities, but the high wages are to some extent simply offsetting the high house prices. And therefore, what you see is still a single uh, distribution. What you do see is that there's a much larger tail to the left in 2016 than in 1980. And therefore, you do have a problem of low wage cities. So this is the, uh, the town decay that I talked about. What's also interesting if you drill down on this is in 1980, a lot of the high wage cities were small manufacturing towns. The top 10% of high wage cities uh, were represented only 8% of US employment. And fully half of that employment was in two places, Detroit and Pittsburgh. By 2016, this has changed dramatically. The top 10% now includes Boston, New York, San Francisco, San Jose, Seattle, and Washington, DC, the super cities that I've been talking about. Now this top 10% represents now 34% of employment. So almost a third of employment is in these cities. And 40% of these are in those six cities that I mentioned, those five cities that I mentioned. So I've talked a lot about the fact that uh, higher house prices uh, meant that uh, labor mis misallocation rose. So it's a very striking um, point here, which is on average, people have actually moved away from opportunity in terms of the fact that the proportion of US employment in the super cities that I've been talking about fell slightly between 1980 and 2016. So despite the fact the IT revolution is creating a lot of prosperity in these cities, their, their numbers were actually falling. And you can actually uh, do some simple calculations of prices and uh, of what would have happened if house price and rise of wages stayed at the 1980 level. And in that case, productivity growth would have been 1.7%, not 0.9%. And that's similar to the rates in the 50s and the 60s. So this distortion due to high house prices is very important. And the way to think about it is if relative 
house price and rate of wages had stayed as in 1980, you'd have had to have over tripled the number of workers in the superstar cities. So you can see what the problem was. You couldn't put enough people into these crowded areas to make the uh, to um, make the economy efficient. And one result of this, you recall, I said house prices mean that people don't employ it. employers don't employ as many people. IT remains a relatively small sector. 2.3% of jobs in, 19, in 2016. Whereas at the height of manufacturing, manufacturing was something like 30% of the jobs in the economy. So what you can see is um, the impact of high house prices in terms of crimping the size of the IT sector. So what I've tried to do is explain to you why I think uh, the IT revolution has not been, uh, has not created prosperity and happiness, it's created, well, some prosperity, but increasing social tensions. And it's been characterized by mediocre growth and increasing uh, economic schisms. And that's true between skilled and unskilled workers, the wages of, un of the skilled versus the unskilled. Cities have boomed, towns have become uh, have decayed, and the young have lost out compared to the old. And this stands in stark contrast to the 1950s and 1960s. And so the obvious question is, what are the policy solutions? Well, I could go on for a long time, but I will simply mention two. The first is to reduce land distortions. And certainly you could have better land use uh, rules. Um, and this would help people to move to these cities. But again, the benefits from that are likely to be significant, but not to really solve the problem. It is not true that the issue in San Francisco or New York or London is mainly due to land use regulation. It's due to the fact there are a lot of people already there. And so that leaves you with palliatives more income redistribution in order to offset the uh, increase in inequality coming from the um, coming from um, the IT revolution. So that's what I had to say. I hope you found it interesting and I look forward to your questions. Tamim, thank you very much indeed. I have no doubt everyone found that as fascinating as I did an extremely interesting set of conclusions. Um, so let, let me start off with the, the questions then. So Edwina Morton has asked, what will be the impact on these assumptions, including the majority of white collar workers, from the AI revolution that we now seem to be experiencing? And that's just such a hot topic. Oh, yes. Well, um, I think the, AI, the AI revolution will have an impact. Uh, the general story about technological revolutions is that people think they will destroy lots of jobs and they don't over time. Think about manufacturing, uh, there was this worry that you know you would destroy all the jobs on farms but in fact everybody you know, in the end uh, people are employed in, in manufacturing and in services. My view about AI is it will have an impact and it will have a disruptive impact, particularly in some, uh, as well as in blue collar jobs, in, in uh, skilled jobs, but that these will be limited. And what you will see is AI will essentially become a tool that people can use to make themselves more productive. So in the end, I think it will create new jobs as well as destroy old ones, and that the long-term impact will be uh, positive. But over the short run, there'll probably be quite a lot of disruption. Thank you, Tommy. And Chris David asks, what about the impact of globalized manufacturing, which has degraded the traditional manufacturing locations in the US and the UK? Surely that's a more important factor than the rise of high cost, high skilled city areas. I'm very glad because I was thinking in the presentation I hadn't got around to talking about the decline in large manufacturing plants and essentially offshoring. 
uh, my view is that offshoring is a result of the IT revolution. So manufacturing occurred at a time when the technology lowered the costs of transportation. So what happened was uh, over the manufacturing uh, industrial revolution, the cost of sending goods around the world plummeted. Uh, what IT did was it lowered the cost of coordination. So these large manufacturing plants, which both made cars, made engines, made cars, and then you put them together, they splintered into different parts. So one plant uh, made engines, another put cars together. Those low value added area, uh, parts of the manufacturing then moved abroad. So it was the breakup of manufacturing into its constituent parts which allowed offshoring. And that was the result of the fact that IT lowered the cost of coordination so that you could actually have one plant in one country and another plant in another country and they could still communicate well enough to function reasonably efficiently. So I regard offshoring as a result of the IT revolution, not as, a set, not as an alternative explanation. Thank you very much. So Clive Bullen asks you to get out your crystal ball and given what you've described, will there be a house price crash soon? I don't think there'll be a house price crash. What I do think, however, is that we are going to be moving into a time of growing equality and high growth. The IT revolution has been stuff has been limited to all of these uh, large cities, but you can see it beginning to uh, move to the rest of the economy, just as manufacturing did. Remember, manufacturing was originally in a very small number of cities. The striking fact, you know, from US is in 1840, Chicago was the small frontier town. By 1890, it was the second largest city in the US. So you had these tremendous uh, changes, but then manufacturing moved elsewhere. You can think in England, firstly it was Yorkshire and Lancashire, and then it moved to the Midlands. I think the same is gonna happen with IT, and the result will be growing prosperity in the rest of the country, a lowering of house, house prices relative uh, house prices. But I don't think there'll be a crash because the prosperity created by IT is genuine. Thank you so much. Uh, Nick Bush has come up with an interesting question. The US and the UK have had a non-interventionist economic philosophy since the 1980s. Have you observed different patterns of income in more interventionist economies? Yes, in that you have seen uh, less uh, of an increase in inequality. But the only major advanced country where um, inequality has stayed relatively, uh, uh, relatively unchanged is uh, France. And there are certainly some countries where, which were known for having very equal distributions, where it's gone up quite a lot. Uh, Sweden would be a very, very good example of that. Um, I didn't have time to get into it, but another part of my research is why the government didn't react to this rise in inequality by providing more social welfare. And briefly, uh, my view is that um, as inequality went up, we know that the rich vote more than the poor. So in a voting model, if inequality goes up, then the average voter becomes richer. And that means that you uh, are less sympathetic to income redistribution. So I think that actually income inequality and changes in attitudes towards income redistribution are actually intimately linked, but I probably don't have time to go into that in more detail. Thank you, Tamim. Adeyu Ajayi Obe asks, what will be the impact of remote working have on house prices as people have much more choice where to live? That I think is a very interesting question. My own feeling is that it won't have a huge impact. It might have some marginal impact as people can move further out as they only come in three days a week. The number of people who will be completely remote working 
I suspect in the long run is not going to be that much. Uh, but I do think that some remote working will happen. As a result, I still think that most people will be tethered to uh, location. And indeed, what I would point out is that this story about remote working allowing people to move out of crowded cities has been a story since the beginning of the IT revolution. So the original idea was that the internet would allow everybody to move away from uh, cities and move to where they wanted to live. But actually the IT revolution saw the booming of, of, of prosperous cities. So I think this idea that somehow cities are going to be left behind is simply not right. As I say, it certainly wasn't right uh, the first time that we heard it, and I suspect it will not be right now. Thank you. Charles Henderson pursues an interesting line of inquiry. He says that the conclusion suggests that a policy solution is a universal basic income, especially in developed economies like the US and the UK. What do you think are the chances that uh, a universal basic income will be introduced as a solution? Won't skilled workers like IT workers push back on this on the basis that others who haven't put the effort in as they have in their skilled areas shouldn't get a free pass? Well, as I say, I think I don't know what's going to happen in terms of universal basic income. Uh, I'm modestly skeptical that it will actually happen. But what I do think will happen is that we will have a new period of relatively high growth, falling inequality and rising redistribution. And the reason I think that, as I said, is I think the IT revolution's benefits will start moving out of um, cities and into the rest of the economy. You can already see this in lots of things. You know, Amazon's warehouse is not located in central London, for example. And uh, as that prosperity increases, you'll get income conversions at least across regions. And as I've said, I think that the political dynamic will then move more towards income re redistribution. And in fact, if you look at income inequality as opposed to wealth inequality, it's stabilized since about 2010. So we've already got, I think, to the peak level of inequality caused by the IT revolution. And as occurred in the 19th century with manufacturing, inequality first went up, then it plateaued, then it started to fall. And I think exactly the same pattern is going to happen with the IT revolution. Uh, Chris David's back for more. Uh, picking up on your comments on offshoring, he's suggesting, do you think offshoring could become more onshoring uh, as businesses adjust to a different political risk environment, so for instance, reducing dependency on China, Taiwan, perhaps even India? Uh, yes, I mean, I don't think that's really uh, a topic that, that this model can talk about. But yes, I do think that, uh, you know, there was quite a long time during in my lifetime during which I think people thought their economics could be thought of as completely separate from the political system. I suspect that that, that the rise of political economy, that there's been a, a renewed rise in political economy. I don't think you can think about economics and politics completely separately anymore. And I do think there'll be a certain level of deglobalization, at least in some areas. Uh, that will mean a certain amount of onshoring. Thank you. And probably, I think we've time for one last question and I'm going to grab the slot. Um, looking at uh, you know, how things come out of left field to surprise us, I don't think six months ago, many of us talked about chat GPT. Uh, and we, we've all learnt to expect black swan effects. Uh, do you think there are some black swan effects out there that we are underestimating at the moment that will come and sort of really hit us for six in terms of changing the fundamentals? No, I'm, I'm more of a technologist um, uh, optimist than a pessimist. Um, think about manufacturing. What was the manufacturing revolution all about? Well, essentially, it was all about people being able to, to take mechanical power and use it to create things. So it 
before the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution, essentially all power was provided by people or beasts. I mean, there was a bit of water power and stuff, but essentially it was people and beasts. What man the, the Industrial Revolution allowed was the people to augment that with mechanical power generated by electricity or fossil fuels or whatever. In the same way, the IT revolution allowed people's uh, brains, their, their abilities to think, to be uh, augmented by computers. And so that you were able to, you know, ring up and, uh, you know, somebody would answer who was not a, a real human being and direct you. I see AI as a continuation of that trend. It's uh, again allowing people to, to augment their own um, cognitive abilities with information technology. And I think it will increase the scope of human beings just as the Industrial Revolution increased the scope in terms of energy, it'll increase it in terms of how much you can do cognitively, but I don't think it'll have any fundamental effects. So I think it will be an augmentation, not a, not a replacement. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that has been an absolutely fascinating tour around this extremely germane and interesting subject. Um, so I would like to close by first thanking our sponsors once more for enabling us to put on uh, this program of events. I would also commend to you uh, the events that uh, are coming up. Uh, and uh, I think they equally have uh, some fascinating content that uh, I hope you will enjoy. Uh, and I would very much like to uh, thank Tamim for uh, sharing with us this afternoon the results of his research uh, and throwing himself open to the uh, vigorous cross-questioning of the audience. And I would like to thank you, the audience, for attending this afternoon and participating in the event. And I wish everybody a good day, evening or afternoon, depending on wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.